Okay, um, let me get started. Uh, I guess, can people hear me out in TV land? I, last I saw, yes. Um, can everyone confirm that? Good. Okay, um, I'd like to start off with uh, a quick discussion about uh, homework one. Homework one, I gather, is due on Thursday. Is that correct? Okay, how many people have started it? Okay, I still see a little twitching here, not, not big twitching. Um, any questions about um, homework, any questions or comments or discussion about the homework? Okay. What would be expense? Oh, wait, hold on. I'm guessing, did I say next week? Okay. Actually, that may very well be true. Let's just double check that. It is not, it is not due this week. It might, in my other class, it's due on Thursday. So you're okay. Um, any questions? So, so thanks for the correction. Um, and I look happy with the answer. I always like to please people with the answers to my questions. Um, any uh, comments about the homework then before we move on? Okay, for those of you in TV land, again, there's a surge of people coming in now, but there's still plenty of seats in the room. So if you wanted to, um, what you call it, if you wanted to uh, come into lecture, this is now uh, a, 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 certainly a possible thing. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, um, let's start off today. What I would like to talk about is something that um, many people, that may sound dull, but is actually one of my favorite topics in uh, data science, um, which is the question of cleaning data. Um, you know, one thing that is typically a make or break thing in a lot of projects is how successfully, you, you know, you. You get data, a data set from someplace, maybe you merge two data sets together and you want to get to work and study. Um, in, many, in many cases, there are, is a certain level of pre-processing that if you see what the problems are with the data set and you can pre-process them away, suddenly everything, you know, you get wildly better results, wildly more meaningful results. And, um, you know, Quite often, I will see students, in, you know, in here or in some other kind of study that, that didn't do a, a level of cleaning before they did their data set. And, and you know, the results are meaningless. And, um, you know, there's this famous saying, garbage in, garbage out about computing. When the data in is not any good, the results at the end are not going to be any good. And, um, you know, so what I'd like to talk about today are a bunch of different techniques that uh, come into uh, clean, you know, you use to try to, um, you know, take a data set and, and get rid of some of the problems, make it easier to build models from. And, uh, you know, um, again, there's going to be issues of uh, how do you unify data? How do you make it compatible? How do you impute missing values? Um, and how do you tell errors from artifacts? So this is a kind of a fundamental thing with data, I think, when it comes to working with it. Um, you know, whenever you have a measurement process, there is often error that is involved with measuring it. Okay, if you take an image, there's probably gonna be noise on the image because there's a certain amount of bits, or, you know, uh, of sensor bits were broken or somebody had a fingerprint on the lens or something like that, okay? So there's always a certain amount of error and that's information that's kind of somehow fundamentally lost and you gotta live with it. Um, a second thing that happens are what I will call artifacts. And artifacts are what I consider to be a consequence of what happens when you process data. And quite often there are artifacts of how the data was collected or something that went on in the world. And, um, you know, you can remove or clean up these artifacts, okay? And so recognizing that data has these kind of problems that are, you know, kind of inherent processes that you can do something about is, is kind of an important thing. 
And um, in here, I will talk often about sniff t- the sniff test. What is the sniff test? Okay, when you go into a grocery store, how do you know whether or not some meat or vegetables you are buying is fresh or fish? You hold it to your nose and you sniff it, right? And likewise, when you look at a data set, it's important that when you are given a data set that you, you kind of, you know, you, you do visualizations of it and you look at it and you see if there are problems, okay? This is the source of many of the troubles with, with, with data analyses or when people don't look at data, they take a data set, they assume everything is right about it and uh, they don't see when there's a problem. And so let me give you an example of a world where there was a, a, a cleaning problem was necessary to make a meaningful analysis of this. In a data set that was a, a professional data set, one shouldn't seem like it would have problems, okay? But um, I was working with some, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a guy actually in physics, okay, who was interested in trying to study the productivity of authors and of, of researchers. He thought it would be great. Wouldn't it be great if we could look at a researcher early in their career and figure out if they're going to be a star or a bum? Okay, and that way, if you're a department, you want to hire the stars. If you could figure out who's going to be a, a really successful researcher, this would be a great thing to be able to do. So what did we do? We took a look at um, publication rec data from PubMed, which is a very reliable source of um, citation, uh, of reference and citation data, um, a ba- which basically has, since they created the database, it basically has any um, paper which would be of interest in medicine. It's put together by the National Library of Medicine. So, you know, not necessarily have all computer science papers, but it will have all biology papers. You know, it's quite representative of a large swath of science. And we wanted to study, um, you know, when was it that, the, among other things, when was it that popular, you know, well-cited scientists started their career, okay? It wasn't a, wasn't a primary issue in our thing. But so we took a look at uh, the 100,000 most frequently cited authors in, in PubMed, okay? And then, um, what you call it, uh, plotted how many of them started their career in any year, okay? Every researcher started their career in a particular year. My first paper was published in 1985, so that's probably when I would have been born. Whether I'm in the top 100,000, I think so, but, uh, you know, that's that's not relevant for here. What would the distribution of authors born in a particular year, academically born, meaning when their first paper came out. What should that look like as a function of year? Does anyone have an idea what that distribution should look like? Again, we can, you can imagine a graph. The x-axis is the year. The y-axis is the frequency of birth of top scientists. What should that distribution look like? Does anyone have an idea? Anyone in TV land have an idea what that distribution should look like? A right skewed graph. Or make a proposal. Okay, so now I'm seeing someone on there says bell curve with the average age of the generation. Now, a bell curve, let's think what a bell curve would look like. Do we think it would be a bell curve? A bell curve would mean that around the mean of the year, which means about halfway through the scientific revolution, more people would be born that year. Okay, do I really believe that? I don't think I believe that. I don't see any reason why that should be true. Okay, what would any other shapes that people would have, yeah? Increasing species in the evolution and then the local degree. Say that again, I didn't quite get that. So the graph will increase rapidly during the uh, uh, scientific evolution, and then it will, the slope will change. You're saying it should look something like this. Uh, no, no, it will just it will go up, uh, but the rate with, rate with which it will go, it will go up will uh, 
Okay, so you're saying if I'm gonna try that, let's see if I can erase this. Hold on. Hold on, I am surprised that I cannot, uh, bingo, okay. Let's try it again. I think what you were saying is something would look like this. Is that what it is? Why do you think it should look like that? Why should it start growing at some point? Yeah, because uh, I think right now, uh, the top, uh, you know, the invention which we are going on is a little bit of stagnant. We really need some kind of break. Okay, let me just hold on a second. I'm going to pin myself here. Enable, hold on, just so I can look at that better. Why do I think that this is like this? Well, maybe what you're saying is that in the beginning, there weren't very many scientists. Okay? And so if they were, you know, if everybody, you know, when cavemen were around, there were very few scientists. And so they didn't write, weren't one of the top 100,000. They didn't write a lot of papers, right? But then eventually... The science got established. And then you would say, um, maybe this, you're telling me that the same number of people should be born each year. I don't know if that's what you're saying. Why is it going to be flat like that? We're slowly increasing. It will be increasing, but the rate with which it is increasing won't be that. Why do you think it's going to be increasing? Yeah, because more and more the population is increasing. Okay, so you're saying that there's more and more science going on. And because there is more and more science going on every, uh, you know, with time, you would expect more, more great scientists or, or, or prominent scientists to be born in, in later, you know, appear in later years than before. Okay. Any other ideas of what the slope, shape of this current distribution might be? Well, when uh, the student I was working with, analyze the data. This is what he got. Okay. He got that at the beginning, there were very few prominent scientists in the top 100,000. Very few of them were born in the early 60s. There was a tremendous explosion of people who wrote their first paper around 1963, 64, something like that. Then prominent scientists died off only to reemerge with a bang in 2001. Okay. This is this is this what this distribution should look like? Okay. Now that's what the data say. If you took the 100,000, you, you went through all the names of the authors, you counted how many papers that they had or how many citations they had. And you took the 100,000 biggest ones, this is what you got. Okay. So the student said, this has to be right. So, well, how could this look like it? He said, well, you know, there were differences in science funding and that the government only started giving science funding. Um, what you call it? Uh, stop, slowed down in the 60s. And only in 2001 did they start giving a lot of money and that caused a lot of scientists to start. Did I believe that? I did not believe that, okay? What was the case when you look and said, look at this, look very, very carefully at your data, and is there something that's causing this? And what was causing it, okay? Well, starting around 2002, PubMed started using full names for authors, okay? Back, if I, you know, in my first paper in 1985, I was S. Skeena, or maybe S. S. Skeena, Suddenly in 2002, I became Stephen Skeena, right? So under that condition, what does that mean? If you look at it, why does it have this shape in this world? Well, if you were a, a, a big productive scientist with an active career, okay, you would appear twice in the database. One, as you know, with your initials, and one with your um, full name. Does everybody see that? What other things in here are explained? Why is there a gap? Why are there no important scientists that grew, that came over there? Missing data, why missing data? Why, why if you were born in 1995, were you doomed not to be considered a top scientist here? Too 
they were too young and it only captured, well, part of it was they were too young, part of it was that they were only gonna capture part of their career, right? If you were gonna go on and write half your papers as S.S. Skeena and half as Stephen Skeena, you could be two half not good scientists instead of one good scientist, right? Or if they were really a hotshot, they wouldn't get recognized until here. They wouldn't have accumulated enough papers to be born under the, the old name, okay? But they were born instantly under the new name. Does everybody kind of get that idea? And after we unify it, okay, we get a distribution that starts to look like it, you know, look, look more reasonable to me. Why was it that there were so many scientists born in 1965 or so? What? You say scientific revolution? Does anybody else have any idea? The what? Right, this is a database. The database didn't include papers. It looks like the database started including papers basically around this time. That's when they started, you know, indexing a lot of journals, right? So if you were a great scientist of the 40s, you were invisible to this, right? But if you had been a great scientist of the 50s, the second half of your life was lived under this regime. And so you did accumulate papers and were considered to be good, right? Why is it that it tapers off? Does anybody have an idea? A proposal? Why is it that there aren't any, any good scientists being born anymore, according to this? Why is it that none of you guys are great scientists? What? You're yet to be discovered. In order to be in the top 100,000 authors, you have to accumulate something. There's a certain life history, right? It takes some time to do that, okay? And so the difference is that, you know, someone here, if you see someone at that point, there was a young person who was a real hotshot who managed in only, you know, 10 years or so to accumulate enough results to be among the top 100,000 scientists over full careers, right? Okay. Does everybody get the point on how, um, by, by thinking about it and using the name unification right, suddenly the data meant something? And before that, it would have meant nothing. Any question about that? Okay. So um, this is one of the, I happen to like data cleaning because quite often there are problems there that if you don't catch it, your analysis is meaningless. Okay. And um, if you do catch it, you should feel smart. Okay. What else can I say? Um, what what other ways can you massage data in order to make comparisons across different points in the data meaningful? Um, I'm going to talk about several different kinds of unifications, you know, changing units, making sure that you represent numbers and character codes right, okay, fixing names, this is often a big deal, fixing time and date and money and things like that. So one issue that comes up when you often when you are merging data sets is that there are often unit conversions. Okay? In the United States, we measure height in my height is in feet and um, into my height is in feet uh, and, and inches typically. I am 5'8, okay? Now, how how tall are someone of you? How tall are you? Are you 5'11", or are you, in, or are you measured in meters? Back in India, do you measure people in, in inches and, and uh, okay, so in India, you guys uh, still are measured in feet and inches. But in the civilized world, people use the metric system, right? <laughs> and in most of the world, people use the metric system. And that I would instead be something like, instead of being 5'8", I should be something like two meters or something, a little less than two, 1.8 meters or something like that. And you could very easily imagine accumulating data on heights from a couple of different files. And you could imagine some people were measured, the height field was in meters, and some people the height field was in feet, right? Or in inches. 
How would you be able to tell after you did a merge of, of data sets, let's say, that you did something dumb when it came to height? Could you imagine if we had a if we had a, a a data set on height where some people were measured in feet and some people were measured in meters? How would you tell? What? Data would be skewed. In what way would it be skewed? You say outliers. Outliers mean that you got unusually tall and unusually short people. You know, if I'm measured in meters, let's stop and think about it. Measure me in meters, I'm 1.8. Are there people who are 1.8 feet tall? I think they are called children, aren't they? There are people who are 1.8 feet tall, right? On the TV, they seem to have a, a better answer. What about multiple peaks? If I took a look at the distribution of this, what would I expect? I would expect there would be a meter world and there would be a feet world. And maybe they overlap. Maybe they even overlap substantially. But, it, but we would expect that height should be normally distributed. It should be distributed with a bell curve, right? And if when I look at my data and I see that it's not a bell curve with a reasonable mean and a reasonable standard deviation, that's a sign that there's a problem. Ideally, you figured this out before you tried to merge it, but it's not at all clear, okay? Any questions? Um. Actually, has anybody, I don't know if anybody's ever done this, is to see if it's, has anybody ever had to fill out a form where their, meet, their height was, they asked their height and they didn't specify the unit? And some people probably put down meters and some people probably put down foot, feet. Certainly it doesn't strain credibility that that could happen. I think this might happen when you do, you know, merging things across this thing. In general, bimodal distributions are, um, a uh, sign of trouble if it's something that shouldn't be bimodal. Okay. Okay. Although think about it, should height in the United should height of people in, be bimodal or not? What the, should the distribution of height in the United States be among adults? Yeah. You say normal. Well, we'll talk about that for sure. Is it possible that it's bimodal? Do men and women have different things going on when it comes to height? I do think it's true, right? If you're looking at the population, it's not going to be perfectly normal, as we'll talk, we talk about normality, right? And, you know, so, so there's a certain level on which one has to be, you know, thinking about explanations for things, but something this weird would, you know, would not be explained by that. And that's a sign that there's a problem. Um, and again, this problem with unit conversions and getting unit conversions wrong is a big problem. You know, NASA lost a, uh, a spaceship to Mars. It kind of blew up. And then when it blew up, some, they did an investigation. And ultimately, it came down that in the software, somebody had done a metric to, to English unit conversion in a bad way. And so the mission blew up. Okay. Any questions about that? Now, I mentioned before one way, that, how could we merge? Let's say we have a file like, um, what, where there's a category, which well, let's say, let's say there's a column labeled thingamabobs and you've got two spreadsheets and people have thingamabobs. I don't know what thingamabobs are, but you have one group, one, two spreadsheets that you want to merge on this. How could you merge the, the, the column in an appropriate way if the values are quite different? Let's say somebody's thingamabobs were measured by, by me measured in kilograms and somebody else's thingamabobs were measured in pounds, but you don't know that. One idea that sometimes comes up is this notion of a z-score, which I know I've mentioned several times. It's not, shouldn't be such a mystery. A z-score converts a number to a value x to a value x minus the mean of x, the mean of the value, divided by the standard deviation. Okay? So x, let's say x is a numerical, z 
Okay, if x is a numerical quantity, if you take x minus the mean and of that uh, of that quantity and divide by the standard deviation, you get a score with some interesting properties. What is the average value of z for any data set? Zero, right? For every element, you're subtracting it from the mean. So the mean of these z-scores is going to be zero, right? And what it, it, it isn't obvious, but if you normalize it by the standard deviation, it turns out the standard deviation of this thing is going to be one afterwards, okay? So what does that mean? If you've got one column of thingamabobs measured in kilograms and something measured in, I don't know, um, moles or some other unit. You don't know what the units are. If you converted them to z-scores, these quantities are probably relatively comparable. Does that kind of make sense? If you took the z-scores measure, a positive value means you're bigger than the mean. A lower value, a negative value means you're lower than the mean. How far is interpreted as number of standard deviations away? It's probably meaningful to compare these things across data sets. We're just concatenating them would be, uh, would not change it. Any questions about that? Okay, so that's one thing you can kind of do. But the main thing is that when you're integrating th data, you have to be very careful you're not doing something stupid with unit conversion. Any questions? Now, another problem that comes up is that numbers often come out of computers in as floats or reels or something like that. And sometimes you need them as integers. Sometimes they should be as integers. And um, there's all kinds of stories that are, of what happens when people convert numbers between representations in bad way. There's another rocket. This was a French rocket that blew up and when they discovered when why did this blow up well the software person had tried to convert a 64-bit floating point number to a 16-bit integer and did it in a clumsy manner okay um so why should you represent numbers in your spreadsheet one thing that's true is that generally um measurements are, should be decimal numbers. Decimal numbers are good things, okay? Um, counts, however, should be integers. And um, sometimes there's problems when people represent counts by real numbers, okay? It, it obscures what they mean. It, you know, um, it doesn't do good for anybody. Sometimes people represent fractional things. Um, in, uh, in, in, in funny ways. Um, when they were in the babies, in, in when we were doing the project uh, on uh, baby weights, the data set that we had had um, the baby weight of babies being born as one column was the, the weight in pounds, an in integer, and one pound column was the, the, the remainder of it the number of ounces as an integer. So if I was five pounds, eight, I, I, you know, my kid was five pounds, five ounces, okay, the values would be five and five in here. Now, to make a meaningful analysis of weight, you want those two numbers have to be combined, right? If instead it was, the kid was 5.4 pounds or something like that, that would enable you to do something, okay? And so it's important to keep things not as fractional things, um, but to keep them, you know, as, as floats. Actually, when you, in, in, again, we've established you guys are measured in, in, in feet and in inches. Are you measured in pounds or, or in, in ounces or are you measured in kilograms? Okay, so now this is a great thing. So if we merge Indian, you know, height statistic, you know, personal records with American records, Notice that there's an incompatibility here, okay? And if we had Europeans in here, they'd look quite different, right? They would, they would be measured, your, your, your weights are metric, but your, your heights are English, okay? Any questions about that? Okay, so this is something to be vigilant about.
Another thing to be vigilant about that uh, happens with data sets is in text data set are character codes. One thing to recognize is that there are many different character encoding systems out there. Um, and a common thing, uh, you know, a common thing on certain web pages is to see something like this, where if you have foreign language stuff, sometimes the foreign language stuff recognizes as all question marks. And the reason for that, of course, is that there's a character code problem. And character code problems often occur. Again, many times people here have said, oh yeah, it's great, I can get data, I can scrape it from the web. Well, you have to, if you're gonna scrape text data from the web, you have to make sure you know what character code they are using. And as I recall on HTML, I believe that, that all, all HTML documents do not use the same character code, if I am correct, right? You specify the character code somewhere within the document. I'm seeing enough people to not nod that, right? That means that if you blindly scrape from a document, you have no idea of what you're actually getting, right? And, you know, um, you know my favorite character codes are there is a standard... Um, you know, single byte encoding, okay? I, I think of it as ISO Latin, okay? That is like an 8-bit code for representing, I'll say, Western alphabets, okay? And this is neat. Each character was one byte. Everything was beautiful. But then they discovered there was another, a rest of a world out here where you guys spoke different languages, right? And they came up with a, you know, Unicode thing. And... Unicode is a is a character code coding which is designed to encode every alphabet of every language, but it can't fit in eight bits anymore. So there is kind of a a complicated encoding system called UTF-8 that encodes characters as you know as I think if I think about it, Western characters generally are encoded still in eight bits. But there is an escape character that gets you into longer encoding. So maybe most other characters might involve two two bits, or uh, you know, um, what you call it M might involve um, two you know two bytes, or maybe even three or four bytes. Okay, making sure you understand the character encoding is essential if you're going to be scraping text and making sense of it. Any questions about it? And once you scrape it, it's too late. That's the other problem, okay? So this is something that you have to make sure you're doing right at the beginning, okay? Any questions? Okay. Boom. What other cleaning um, uh, issues come up a lot? Well, a lot of, certainly a lot of the data I tend to work with involves names. And I think, you know, a lot of data in the world, you know, you're going to work for a, a company, that company's going to have customers, okay? Um, you know, names get mangled in certain ways, okay? And I'm sure pretty much you guys may have names, many of you may have names that get mangled more than other people, okay? My name on the web, you can find, I, my first name is either Steven, Steve, or S, depending upon who you talk to, okay? My middle name is either I don't have a middle name or I have Sol or I have my abbreviated thing, S, okay? My last name is either spelled right or people swap value, vowels or they stick in an extra N, okay? So if you wanted to get, let's say, a complete look, reference to all places where I am on, you know, all web pages, let's say, that mention me, okay, recognize that... Um, you know, that, that it's not one simple query, okay? Recognize that there's problems also with the fact that um, sometimes things are uppercase and sometimes things are lowercase, right? Certainly my name has been written someplace on the web as capital Skeena, okay? And sometimes all small case and stuff like that. So how do you unify all the references? This is one of the things we had to do with that citation data, right? Well, 
typically what you need to do is to use some kind of a transformation, okay, um, to try to unify names. Often what you will do is say, well, two names are the same if they, uh, you delete the middle name, you make everything lowercase, and they are equal, right? That might be one analogy, okay? That might that would capture some of these things, like that would capture the effect of what my middle name is. Notice that it won't catch the skiana or the skina here, right? How can you hope to unify that? There are um, phonetic hashing methods. Has anybody here ever heard of Soundex or Metaphone? Okay. These are um, methods that are kind of funny. They look really hokey, but are surprisingly useful. What they will do is they will be a set of rules that take names and um, map them to kind of canonical representations. First thing they will do, for example, is delete duplicate letters. So if you have two letters that are next to each other, they will delete them. If you have a rule like that, suddenly Skina and Skiana become the same, right? They will also replace vowel sounds that are very, very similar with a different kind of code, right? And the hope is that they're trying to unify names so that you know you're more likely to catch misspellings and these work out pretty well now what's the problem if you try to merge p names which basically on different misspellings and things like that the good thing is you might get a complete record of all the skeena all stephen skeena articles what else would there be what what it would be a problem okay Sometimes you're going to create Franken people. What is a Franken? Remember Frankenstein? He was cut, you know, as I understand, he was made from a bunch of bodies cut, put together, right? You could very, very easily suppose, let's, let's say, I, there's an evil twin computer scientist named Steve, you know, named Stephen Skinner. Okay, then these two would get merged together, right? And they shouldn't be. Okay. And so they recognize that when you do these kind of methods, there's a trade-off between false positives and false negatives. If you do this kind of norm, name normalization, you will merge, you know, you will, you will get a better representation in terms of errors for people. But sometimes you're going to make, you're going to merge two completely different people together. Okay. Any questions? How can you avoid merging two completely different people together? Is there any possibility about how you do it? You sort of, you know, change this. You you, you look at the name, you make it a slight change. Is it that, uh, what, how might you avoid merging two peop different people together? Let's say you were looking at the um, citation data. You could imagine that when I, if I apply some kind of a transformation like this, I might take two different authors and merge them together. How would I try to, how might I try to avoid that? Look at some additional parameters. Suppose that Stephen Skeena looks like a computer scientist and the evil twin Stephen Skeena turns out to be writing papers in English. Okay, or, you know, or, or, or medicine or something like that. Maybe you end up deciding you use auxiliary fields to decide as, as a check to whether or not these people might be merged, right? That's one way to minimize it. But ultimately recognize you've got a trade-off. And, uh, you know, um, when you've got a trade-off like this, uh, you know, you've got to decide, is it more important to have merged two people? It's a good question now. Is the risk of merging people together who, who are um, different people more or less important than having um, what you call it, uh, you know, two copies of the same person. What about the citation data? Let's think about the experiments we were doing here. Was this something here when we did this merging with initials? 
certainly trying to take initials and expand them, we probably created some Franken authors. Is that right? Was it worth doing it? There was a trade-off, right? And it was clear that if we didn't do this, the results were meaningful. It was clear if we did it, that the distribution started to look right, right? And um, this was kind of an important thing. Any questions? Okay, any questions on television? No, okay, and again, I see people want the uh, thinking about metadata. Another type of data merging issue that comes up or integration issue tends to come up that's complicated is when you're dealing with time and dates, okay? Um, when you have two different, you know, let's say you, you, you have a sensor system running on different computers, okay? And you're logging when events are happening. Can you just combine the two, you know, fields and uh, say that, you know, let's say you have the, the, the web hits on one machine server and the web hits on another server. Is it safe to just combine the two? Why not? Okay. One thing is the clocks on the two machines are probably slightly different, right? Unless they are being reset by some radio clock, you know, some, some um, you know, atomic clock sometime with great regularity. Times often differ just because the clocks are set differently. But there's all kinds of other things. There's time zone issues. When we change our, um, there's, there's the issue of daylight savings time in the United States. Right now, everything is good. About a, a small number, about a month from now, you guys are suddenly going to, they're going to shift the clock and it's going to get light earlier in the day, but dark earlier in the day also, right? That's what they do with the time zone, right? And so uh, you'll come out at four o'clock or five o'clock and it's dark right? Fortunately, you'll be able to walk to my class and it'll be sunny, okay? But, um, but whether or not this, the, the time period is uh, daylight savings time is, is a problem if you're integrating it. Um, now, the standard time for international time, so the history of time zones is actually quite interesting, but um, there is now this notion of coordinated universal time, which is UTC, okay, which still kind of assumes that the day starts in Greenwich, England, okay, which was kind of where the Royal Observatory was, and they'd established that as the beginning of the, the day, okay? But, and this presumably uh, does not worry about, you know, daylight savings times do not change the uh, UTC, Okay, so, so, you know, recognize that when you're using times, the hours can be different. Recognize that dates can be different. Can anybody look at that calendar up there? And does anything look unusual? Did anything interesting happen in September of 1752? Or was it just another month? Does anybody see anything interesting about sep September of 1752? Looks like a short month, right? Okay, what happened? Okay, does anyone know what happened in 1752? There was this, that was a switch from the Julian to the Gregorian calendar, okay? And, um, you know, that, that, uh, Roman, the Roman Empire, Julius Caesar, kind of like established a calendar for the Roman Empire. And then, you know, after 1500 years or, or, or so, because it didn't exactly make a calendar year equal to an astronomical year, season started to shift, okay? You know, that's why you have leap year. Why do you have leap days? We have leap years and leap days to kind of keep the, the, our calendar in sync with the seasons, okay? And, um, but even with that, it, you know, over enough time, they, they uh, made the, uh, you know, it kind of, it got out of phase, okay? And people started, you know, you know what, what people thought of as when winter started, it had gotten cold a lot earlier than that and stuff like this. So 
the Pope said, in this month, we're going to delete 10 days or something like 10 days from the calendar. Okay, and that's going to get it back in sync with the traditional seasons. And um, supposedly there were riots because people thought that their lives were going to be made 10 days shorter. Okay, mm -hmm. when they did this, so they lost 10 days of their life. But, um, but this has all kinds of things. So, for example, in the United States, George Washington's birthday was a holiday, right? What day is George Washington's birthday? Well, who knows? George Washington was born in 1732. He was born before this, okay? Is George Washington's birthday on the same date it was back in 1732, or do we adjust it for 10 days? If you wanted to figure out his lifespan, you'd better do the adjusting, right? So there are weird things that happen with calendars, okay? And you have to kind of be aware of that when you're integrating certainly old, old uh, dates. Even things, modern things, there's things that happen because there's differences between business weeks and full weeks, okay? So suppose, let's say, you wanted to do a study of the weather and the stock market. Does good weather, if it's good weather, do people buy more stocks that day or not? Okay, you might imagine a world where people see it's a nice day. Oh, I'm going to go buy some Amazon. Or you could imagine this is a nice day. I'm going to go out in the park and I'm not going to buy any stocks today, which would have hurt it, presumably. Or you could imagine that it makes no difference. I'm managing my money. What does it matter if it's outside? But if you wanted to do a study of this, this is complicated by the fact that weather occurs every day. Stocks don't get bought and sold every day, right? There are holidays. There are, um, what you call it, there are weekends. Do you measure the, the weather of a weekend? Does the weather of the weekend matter? Should, the, should Monday be dealt differently because there was a weekend before it or not? Okay? These are the kind of things that you might want to think about if you're trying to deal these things right. Any questions about it? About calendars or anything like that? When you're dealing with money, there are also all kinds of different things that uh, that happen in unifying it. What when you want to talk about how much is, uh, you know, let's say when you call up, I'm guessing many of you call up your, uh, you know, you, you you get a summer job offer, okay, and you call up back home and you tell them, oh, I'm getting X number of dollars a week, you know, and you tell you tell you tell someone back home. Is that good or bad? Well, it doesn't mean anything unless it's converted to the local currency, right? And then they can make a comparison. So there's a problem with currency that uh, you have to worry about exchange rates, and you have to make sure you use the exchange rate at the time, okay? Uh, I can tell you my book royalties, uh, they do the conversion from my, uh, you know, my, my annual royalties all depend upon the currency rate as of um, January 1st, okay? So I am rooting for the U.S. dollar to be very, very strong on January 1st and weak the rest of the year. I am happy now if the currency collapses and all you people around the world say, oh boy, I can buy Skeena's book and it only costs me three rupees or something like that, okay? So long as it's strong, on, um, and, and this, of course, is the wrong thing. If, if, if the currency really did something weird, I either have a great year or a bad year, independent of how many books get sold, right? Um, you know, um, there are issues with, uh, what you call it, uh, the time value of money, okay? If you want to make, even if you stick all terms in dollars, a dollar today is not the same thing as a dollar a year ago, okay? Because there is, you know, there there is an, you know, there is inflation. Right now, we're in a time where some people fear there's a lot of inflation, okay? Or certainly there is maybe more inflation than there was a year ago, okay? A dollar probably should today is worth a little bit less, maybe four or five percent less than a dollar a year ago, okay? If you're doing some kind of an analysis of prices over time, 
maybe this is something you need to keep in mind, right? And, uh, you know, one of the dumbest things, you know, one of the things I like about having people watch the quant shop videos is you see other groups falling into traps. And that's one of the things. One of my favorite group traps was there was one group that was supposed to look at the stock market and make stock market predictions. And they very proudly reported to me that there was a co positive correlation between the price of oil and the stock market. And I said, that's crazy. Why would that be? You know, when the price of oil goes up, is it good for Amazon? No, they've got to have all these trucks that they're paying. Is it good for the airlines? No. And they said, well, it's correlated. Okay. And I said, what period did you do the analysis for? And they looked at a 30 year day data period. Why was it that the prices of stocks were correlated with the price of oil over a 30 year period? This was inflation. Okay, 30 years ago, the price of everything was, 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 was much less, be it a share of, of, of a stock or a, um, what you call it, a gallon of oil, right? When they did this correlation, it was not a correlation that was showing that there was a meaningful interaction between the two. It was simply showing the fact that all prices were, all, were small then and big now, right? And so you can often miss these things if you're dealing with large long-term correlations. Any questions about that? You know, like, you know, we had other projects where people were trying to predict movie grosses. And, you know, you always see every time a new Avengers movie comes out, they tell you, oh, it's the best-selling movie in all history. It raised more money than any other movie in history. Well, why is that? Because Gone with the Wind, it was made in 1939. And the dollars then, you know, every dollar then was really worth something. Every dollar then was worth 10 times what a dollar is now, right? And if you don't make these kind of corrections, you end up with a meaningful analysis. Any questions? One other thing, just to, that when it comes to converting and, and cleaning data, again, we have a hedge fund in town, you know, Renaissance Technologies which is a great hedge fund that's, you know, that happens to be located in Stony Brook. Undoubtedly, a lot of the people that they hire clean data for a living. They are a quant thing. They, they take in financial data, you know, and there are all kinds of, even for things like a stock price, what a stock price means is not a straightforward thing. Okay. Does, any, does anybody know what a stock split is? What is a stock split? Maybe you guys will work for a company which has a stock split. Anybody? Yeah. Right. So now what, what a, a split is when a company has been doing well, the price of its share may get to be too high for people to buy an individual share, right? Maybe I want to invest in your company, but if, if, if each share, like Berkshire Hathaway is famous for each share is $100,000 or so. Can I buy a $100,000 share? Not obviously. But no, so normal companies, what they will do is when the price gets too high for a share, they'll maybe split it into five. You said split it into five. And now if you own one old share, now you own five new shares, right? Are you richer? Are you richer or poorer when you get the five new shares? It's the same, but the price has dropped by uh, twenty, you know, to, to twenty percent of what it used to be, right? Now, if you just look at the price of the share each day, what's the time series going to look like? I'm doing great, doing great. Boom! Did something terrible happen? Nothing happened, right? You have to kind of normalize stock prices. If you're going to look at a stock price, there has to be an appropriate normalization. Okay. Does anybody know what happens with dividends of a share when they, when they issue shares of, of, of stock? You know, stocks sometimes pay dividends. They'll pay money back to the shareholder. What happens to the price of a stock when they pay a dividend? Immediately, the price drops. Why is that? 
If you own the stock here, you got the dividend check. If you own the stock here, you didn't get the dividend check, right? If you, here, you own a, a share and a check, okay, the check has value. Basically, th that's accounted for in the stock price, okay? Again, if, 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 if you don't correct for the dividends, an analysis for time series of prices is meaningless. Any questions? Okay, so these are things you've got to look out for. Any questions about these kind of cleaning strategies? Okay, another aspect of cleaning that is important, okay, is, is how you deal with missing data. Um, you know, often there are fields that are left blank in a data set. Why? Maybe they didn't, the guy didn't enter it. Maybe it didn't seem like it was appropriate. Maybe they didn't even know what the value could have been. Okay? It's quite often you get an incomplete data set where for certain records, certain fields are left blank. And the question is, what should you do about it? Okay? You know, the natural thing to do is, oh, I'll just leave it at zero. Usually for a blank, maybe they put in a zero or a minus one. One possibility is you just leave it as a blank or a, a zero or a minus one. Usually that does something terrible, okay? Because, uh, you know, it, it, it renders the whole column meaningless. If you look at the distribution, if we have something like, let's say, what's the year somebody died in Wikipedia? What's it gonna look like if we leave leave it blank? Okay, if we set, if we set a, a, a left blank to be zero, it probably, the distribution's going to look something like this, okay, right? Because uh, nobody, you know, a lot of people will be said to have died in year zero because those are the ones that are still alive, right? The rest of them will have died from 18, you know, 1700 to, to, to today, okay? So, you know, how do you deal with missing values, okay? And again, there's different kind of missing values. Um, sometimes that there are values that are put in um, left blank. Sometimes they are put in with silly values, okay? Um, and sometimes there are things that, that happen too rare to be seen. So, um, you know, you, 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 you sometimes in data sets, you don't see something because it's a very, very rare thing. And... Is, is the fact that you haven't seen it mean that the probability is zero, okay? The answer is, you know, no, but properly accounting for that is kind of an important thing. So how do we deal with missing data, okay? The one, gen, one technique you could do is if you have enough records, okay? If you have millions of records to train on, and a few of the data and 10% and of them have missing values, what is one thing you can do? You can throw them out and just use the complete records, okay? Now, that's, that's not a terrible thing to do if you have, um, you know, complete data, if you have a lot of data there. Although sometimes there's a, there, there's a field, right? In Wikipedia, you have, you know, several million people in Wikipedia. If you left out the records for who, people whose death year was not specified, what would you be deleting? You, maybe you're only deleting 10% of the people in Wikipedia, but what are you deleting? You're deleting all the living ones, right? All the modern ones. And that's now, that introduces some kind of a bias in your data set, right? That would probably be a, be, be a wrong thing to do. Okay, as opposed to a good thing to do. Okay, um, you often it's better if you tr impute the data set, if you try to predict what the um, what you call it, what the mi missing value would be. Okay, so if we got living people, okay, what is the death year that you should guess for somebody who's living in Wikipedia? Okay. I'm in Wikipedia, okay? I was born in 1961. What year am I gonna die? Okay, if you really know, I'd like to talk to you, okay? 
But how might you impute that value? Can anyone, how would you come up with a model to try to predict what, you know, what that death date is that will give you a meaningful value there? Now, one possibility is the average life expectancy and add that to it. That's probably how I would be doing it. But would it, what about take the average value of the death year of people and use that? Okay. Note that this now is not, this looks like a normal, you know, if we look at, let's say, methods for imputing things, using the mean value of the fields that are there is a common technique. Okay. Now that would do disastrously on the death date thing, right? What's the average death date in Wikipedia? Probably 1950 or so. A lot of old people who really died a long time ago, right? Well, that would mean that the average living person would have died before they were born, right? Does everybody see that in that case, just, you know, knowing something about what the, what the, the field is, is necessary for a meaningful imputation, okay? But there are other kinds of fields, uh, techniques that you might use. One is you always replace it by the mean value, okay? If you had a data set where some people's height wasn't given, would adding in them in as being of average height be a reasonable thing to do? Probably, if height is not such a critical part of your model, okay? One of the great things about if you use replace the missing data by the mean value, one good thing is that the mean value doesn't change, okay? And that that's, that's, a, that's a good thing, okay? And so for many times, using the mean is not a bad idea, right? One other interesting idea that sounds crazy is why don't you take a random sample, a, a random pick of somebody else's height? So you have a database with heights and some people are blank. Pick a person at random and assign you their height. Okay, what does this do? The good thing is on average, if you're picking other people uniformly at random, the average height in the column is still gonna stay the same as it was before, right? So it has the same property there as the mean thing. One thing that's good about doing it randomly sometimes is you get to see, there's a way to tell if this caused a big problem in your model. What if you now retrain, do this again and retrain a second model and you see how different it is? If in fact, when you, when you, when you work with the two trained models, if the results are quite different, then that meant that the imputation really had probably a bad effect, okay? If the predictions are always about the same, then it was probably a safe thing to do. So one thing about this is you can see exactly how much damage you're doing. The other technique is that you can often build a model that's more sophisticated than picking the mean. Maybe use linear regression on a few variables to try to guess what it is. So if we were looking at height, a better thing than just the average population height might be the average height for women or men, depending upon what, what that is. Maybe if we know your weight, we have an idea of what height you probably are, right? On average, if you weigh 100 pounds, you're shorter than someone who weighs you know, 250 pounds, okay? I think that's probably true. You could imagine building a regression model to predict the value of the missing items, okay? Any questions about that? Yeah. Do we use this? Imputing these methods, I mean, these imputing methods, irrespective of the distribution you have, for example, if you have some exponential distribution, then what kind of imputation you can use to see the missing value? Okay, so the question is, does this depend upon um, what distribution you have? And I would say it probably is worth looking at the distribution. Again, generally speaking, I like variables that are bell-shaped, okay? And, you know, bell-shaped, Always picking the mean doesn't have a terrible effect on things. 
Um, you know, if you're doing something that's a power law distribution, there are going to be certain values that are going to be much larger than, than other values. And that makes, for example, the mean a funny thing, right? The mean seller in wealth in the United States is much larger than the median. Okay. So, you know, suddenly people who had missing data are going to look a lot richer on average than most people. Okay. So you're right that, 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 that understanding the distribution probably makes a, a difference in what you're doing. Now, of course, if you do the random imputation, you get to see how much of a problem you caused, right? Because you could repeat it and see if the model is still doing the same thing or not. Okay. Um, but yeah, obviously, a well-behaved distribution is easier to make a, a sensible prediction about than a, than, a, than a badly behaved one. Any questions about that? Yeah. So can we use the correlation with a column width, which is very highly correlated with the column width? Okay, so what you would like is if you're trying to make a prediction, the question is can you use a column that's highly correlated with it? If you have a column that's highly correlated with this value, then that's a great, that, that makes it very easy to build such a model, right? So yeah, if we have, um, you know, your, your, your weight in, um, your height in, in feet and your height in meters, if for some reason they left out the, the height in feet, okay, you would perfectly be able to reconstruct it from the column that was height in meters because there's a perfect correlation between them. But yes, the hope would be that you're going to have some other variables that correlate strongly enough with it that you can make a sensible prediction. Okay, yeah. What would imputation lead to a bias? Well, it depends upon how good or bad a job you did doing the imputation. Obviously, doing random imputation is not going to, well, it doesn't really mean by bias. So we have to be a little bit careful here. Bias would mean that you're kind of skewing the results in a particular direction. Okay. And, um, you know, the answer is potentially that that could happen. Okay, if you did it in a bad way. Okay, so like I said, for example, um, if you replaced people's, if we source people who didn't list their salary, you list, the, replace it by the mean, the mean salary, in fact, is going to be probably higher than it is for most people, you know, for, for, for the actual people who didn't do that. That's going to make them look a lot richer. Probably the people, you know, so, so the answer is it could introduce a bias, okay? Now, the question is, how do you handle that? And that's part of that, that this is where judgment starts to become an issue, right? Why are the values not, not being listed, okay? You know, um, if the reason why you don't have people's income is they're afraid of getting taxed on it, okay? then maybe rich people are less likely to tell you their income than poor people, right? So the question is, is there some mechanism understanding why the thing is blank, okay, is actually a good thing to think about, okay? These are purely mechanical methods that don't necessarily require understanding it. But certainly if you don't understand why there are these properties of your data set, you, you, you can run into trouble. Any questions about that? Okay. Any questions? The, 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 the final thing that I'd like to talk about today um, is uh, has to do with dealing with outliers. Now, um, we are fortunately located near New York City. And in New York City is the Museum of Natural History. And in the Museum of Natural History, okay, this is on the uh, west side of Central Park, is one of the world's great collection of dinosaur bones. I encourage you guys to go into the city and look at the dinosaur bones. Um, now, 
somewhere in that museum, what you know, one of their someone did a study of dinosaur vertebrae, and records show that there is one di- vertebrae is one of the bones in the back on the spine. There is one dinosaur vertebrae that has been reported in the collections of the Museum of Natural History that is 50% larger than any other dinosaur vertebrae ever found. Okay? Now, this is an amazing thing. Why was that dinosaur vertebrae 50% larger than any other dinosaur vertebrae ever found? Was it that it was really a giant dinosaur? Okay? Turns out when someone noticed it, they said, well, why don't you show me the fossil? And they can't seem to find the fossil, okay? Why can't they find the fossil? Probably it never existed, okay? It was a measurement error. Someone wrote down that it was 1,000 millimeters long when it was really, you know, uh, 500 meter millimeters long or something like that, okay? So quite often there are data errors okay, that are the result of some kind of a process that happens. If it's data from transcription, people can write the wrong number, they can type the wrong number, they could read the wrong number, okay? If it's a sensor, the sensor could be going into, you know, into some weird mode and making mistakes for a time, okay? How do you know, what should you do with outlier values? Things that are much larger than expected and much less than expected. And sometimes it's a, pro, it, it, it's a, a problem that's you know, a result of merging two distributions. Again, you guys were telling me, oh, if I had the, 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 the meter people and the feet people, we could delete the largest and delete the smallest. Well, that wouldn't solve the problem, right? because it would still be leaving weird weird people involved. But sometimes there are outlier values that are too big or too small. Now, what should you do when you, how do you discover that? Well, one way is to convert each column to z-scores. Remember, z-scores were how much was a value minus its min, minus the mean, divided by the uh, standard deviation. Any z-score that is too high or too small is really unusual, right? If you did a plot of the z-scores, often you end up getting something that looks like this. Okay, what does that mean? Well, this, these guys are probably suspicious, right? Maybe there is some kind of a systematic error with them, okay? So if you have a normal distribution, okay, things that are too many the standard deviations from the mean are very, very rare. If you see them, there's probably a problem. Any questions about it? Now, the biggest question actually is, um, why do you have the outlier? Okay, so sometimes when people have outliers, They'll recognize it, they'll delete it from the data set to make it better, right? A bigger question is to ask why are there, um, you know, outliers? So one time when we were looking at, um, again, we were doing data analysis of people in Wikipedia, and there was someone, we looked at how long lifespans were. What was the lifespan data of people in Wikipedia? What do you think it should look like? How long people lived in Wikipedia? What do we think that should look like? You probably think it's a bell curve. You get something like this. There was one guy out there who was 969 years old. Who was the guy in Wikipedia who was 969 years old? I believe that's a guy named, in the Bible named Methuselah, okay? He was famous for being old. He didn't do anything but be, live for a long time, right? Now, what should you do? One possibility is you just delete all these records. The other is that you instead fix it and say, well, Methuselah wasn't a real person in the first place. How do I tell real people from non-real people, right? You know, uh what you call it. Harry Potter isn't a real person either, right? 
So you would want that kind of information gone from the database, okay? So often an outlier indicates that you have a problem that's bigger than just those points. And if so, you got to fix them. But in general, so how do you detect them? Usually visually, okay? But that's, all, you know, in one column, it's easy to identify outliers. Sometimes there's outliers where no single column is very big, but, um, you know, or small. But on all dimensions there, they're just a little bit different than everybody else, right? How do you tell? Well, identifying outliers is, a, you know, there's different ways of dealing with it. One way to think about it is um, maybe a point that when you cluster the points, okay, any point that's really far from the center of its cluster is suspicious, right? So maybe that's an argument for what an outlier is. If you're trying to build a model to predict something, should you delete the outliers before you fit the model? Or should you uh, fit the model with the outlier values? Which is the right thing to do? OK. The answer is it depends. Okay, it depends upon why you have outliers there. Okay, if the outliers really correspond to nonsensical data, okay, then you're probably going to get a better model by deleting the outlier point, points before you train the model. Does everybody kind of believe that? You're not going to learn much about human lifespans by having Methuselah in there, right? On the other hand, sometimes people delete outliers simply because they're hard to predict, right? Okay. By definition, an outlier is one that on your training set or on your evaluation set is going to give you probably a pretty bad prediction, right? And, um, you know, if you just delete the outliers points because they are giving you bad results on models or they look weird, you're going to get a model that is going to get a much better test score, okay? Because you're no longer going to pay the penalty for these weird, hard to predict things. But of course, it's not going to learn to predict the weird, hard to predict things, right? So this is again a judgment call. If your points are for real, they probably shouldn't be deleted, even though they are, look quite different than the other values. Okay, instead you want to try to get to the point of predicting it. Any questions about that? Any questions about outliers? Okay, so what I'd like to say now, um, you know, uh, next class we're going to have, um, you know, a, uh, my, my Fahad will, uh, will be back next class to uh, talk uh, about, you know, machine learning type stuff in Python. I encourage you to get far enough in your assignment that you can Start to take advantage of that kind of thing. Get serious about that. Fahad will be here on Thursday, and I will see you next Tuesday. Okay? Any questions? Okay, if not, thanks a lot, and I'll see you next uh, next time. Okay, bye-bye.